Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor, labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It's one of the ways in which Jesus expressed this idea that he came to bring good news to us. And uh, we're going to continue on with our year of the gospel today and uh, continue to look at the good news of God's salvation in Christ to us who deserve none of that but have received it through faith in Him. What, what about standing together and giving glory to God using Him 55? To God be the glory, great things He has done. Let's stand together, 55. <coughs> pray. Lord, we do come this day to acknowledge the great things you have done for us. We know that you have done great things for us in the works of creation and in the works of redemption and in the works of providence. And we come today to re recognize that, to acknowledge you. You are the great creator. You've called all things into being. And we are the uh, beneficiaries of a marvelous and a glorious creation. We have to live within this beautiful world you have provided for us uh, physically. You've also, through providence, provided for us spiritually. You have made us after the image of God, and you have put us together with others, and we get to share the beauty 
and in, in fellowship with one another and relating to one another, and we give thanks for that. We are especially grateful for uh, the relationship of our brothers and sisters in the church, and we pray your continued blessing on us as we serve you together. Lord, we also especially recognize the great work of redemption in Jesus Christ. We deserve no, nothing less than your wrath and your judgment and your condemnation. We were born in sin, and we have lived in sin. We have fully participated according to our sinful nature. Uh, even when we can say that we haven't acted in sinful ways, we have harbored sinful attitudes. We have not uh, held your priorities, and we have not sought to do the things that are most important to you. We have failed to do that which you've commanded. And so we know that we deserve your wrath, and yet in your mercy and your grace... You have loved us and sent, sent us Jesus, the unblemished Son of God, to come and live a righteous life, to die and bear the penalty for our sin, to be raised to win the victory, and who's ascended to heaven to rule over us by His Word and Spirit. Today we celebrate that. We marvel at your grace to us in Jesus, and we pray that you will renew us in Him today, and you will teach us uh, faithfulness to Him as we come in faith. For we come and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hold your hymnals. Let's turn to page 870 in the back. Periodically use some of the catechism questions as a way to do a confession of faith instead of the historic creeds. I thought these are some that touch on kind of what we're going to be preaching about and learning about in just a minute. And um, it's both the bad news and the good news, okay? So it's the year of the gospel. But um, really, it's hard to appreciate good news until you know the bad news, as, as we uh, typically ask. You want the bad news, the good news first? Well, there's the bad news first in the Bible, and then there's the good news. And we're going we're gonna to learn of both of them, and we're going to appreciate more fully the good news, the gospel. So it's 18 through 20. I'll read the questions, and then we'll together read the answers as we uh, affirm these truths um, before God. Let us confess our faith. Wherein consists the sinfulness of that estate wherein to man fell? The sinfulness of that estate wherein to man fell consists in the guilt of Adam's first sin, the want of original righteousness, and the corruption of his whole nature, which is commonly called original sin, together with all actual transgressions which proceed from it. What is the misery of that estate wherein two man fell? All mankind, by their fall, lost communion with God, are under his wrath and curse, and so made liable to all the miseries of this life, to death itself, and to the pains of hell forever. Did God leave all mankind to perish in the estate of sin and misery? God, having out of his mere good pleasure from all eternity elected some to everlasting life, did enter into a covenant of grace to deliver them out of the estate of sin and misery and to bring them into an estate of salvation by a Redeemer. Amen and amen. You may be seated. And... Today, I want to read to you from Genesis 3. Uh, I'm going to read half of it now, and then when we come to the sermon, I'll read the next part, and that's really where the emphasis is. But I thought reading the entire chapter would be important to read the entire episode of the temptation, the sin, the fall, not only of Adam and Eve, but of all mankind, as we just stated. This sin was not just about them, it affected all humanity that proceeded from them in ordinary generation. And uh, so what I'll do is I'll read down through 13 um, for the reading at this point. Yes, Genesis 3, 1 through 13. Give attention the word of the Lord. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say 
You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat it, uh, eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her hu husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Well, that's where we'll pick up in just a minute. That ends the reading of God's word for now. Um, well, I know we should have read the first couple of chapters to set the stage, but um, the bad news, the sin of Adam and Eve, the transgression of God's very direct and simple command, they, uh, they violated that and sinned against him. Um, well, what, uh, what this ought to do when you read of the sin and, and you understand the biblical understanding of how sin entered through them and has come to us, not just the potential of sin, but that we are sinners. We, we have been born in, in a, with a sinful nature. Um, at least at this point in the reading, we can long for wonderful words of life, longing for and wanting and needing something to let us know what can be done about this predicament, what can be done about this state of sin and misery, as the catechism called it. Well, how about we sing of that? 697, uh, in just a little bit, we'll read more of the good news. But for now, uh, we'll encourage each other that uh, God has given us wonderful words of life. You can remain seated as we, uh, as we sing.
the we have some of our people sick we were prepared to sing and yet our director and a voice is out sick so we're gonna save Almighty Cross for you probably for next week okay let's see I think they're going to get the, get the youngins we'll do that everybody's everybody's favorite part of the service right beginning to get nervous. Yeah, here you come. Good. There we go. Hey bud, come on. Let's let's do this children's lesson. Okay, got some uh, I'm going to talk to you about the very beginning of the Bible today. Do you all know what the uh, first words of the Bible are? You'll give it a crack? I'm going to get you started. In there you go. In the beginning. What happened after that? Okay. Uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You'll say that with me? In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, good. Well, here's uh, just a minute ago. We read about when the first people, Adam and Eve, they, they were created by God. And they were put in this place called the Garden of Eden. And they were told they had all these trees to eat from. You know, fruit of various kinds to eat from. And they were told not to eat of the one in the middle of the garden. Does anybody know the name of that tree? The tree of the knowledge of what? Good and evil. So it has a name. It's a long name. But it's, so it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, so they were told not to eat from it. And uh, does anybody know uh, what was there to tempt them? Do you remember this from the story? What, what was it? Snake or serpent? And... Uh, now, when we read that and we read in other parts of the Bible, we understand that it wasn't just any old serpent or snake. It wasn't just like a, you know, rat snake or, you know, corn snake or copperhead or something. It, was, it, it uh, referred to actually Satan coming, the devil coming to tempt them. Okay? And so that's really what it's about. And so um, they were told not to eat of the tree, and the, the serpent comes along and says, this was Satan, did God really say not to eat of that tree? And uh, Eve is the one, she says, well, God said not to eat of it, the one in the middle, we can eat of the other trees, not to eat of the one in the middle, and to not touch it. Now, she, he didn't say don't touch it, he just said don't eat from it. And, but Satan was trying to get her to doubt God's you know, word. And he says, well, God knows that if you eat, you're going to become like him. You're going to know good and evil. And then it said, here's how it went. It says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took and ate. She gave some to her husband who was with her. That moment their eyes were open. And then, they, then they felt shame and nakedness. And God comes along. Now here, the reason I want to recount that with you is this, is that God has made, He made the world and it was all good. The first chapter of the Bible says everything was good. And then He made Adam and Eve in His image and they had this wonderful place to live. And they sinned. Okay? Now what a sin is, what, when we say sin, we're talking about doing something against what God has said. Okay? And for them, that sin was eating that fruit. Okay? 
And since then, that meant that all humanity, every person that was born, was going to be born into a condition where we were sinners. Now, last week I asked you, are you a sinner? Well, let's raise our hands. If we're sinners, have you ever done anything wrong? <clears throat> yep, we, we, we got it. Well, the reason you're a sinner is because you have a nature. You have some, you are, your nature is that way, okay? It's not just that you are some, something strange in the whole world. No, we all are that way. But God doesn't intend for us to stay that way. He intends to redeem us and to save us by Jesus. And today, we're going to get to a verse in which even when they sinned, even when they done, did what was wrong in God's eyes, here's what happens. God showed them love and mercy. You know what he did? When they felt shame for their nakedness, he made some skins for them to put on so they would be covered. And he assured them that there would be someone who would come and take care of that serpent, that snake. And he's not talking about the snake. He's talking about Satan. So already... See, the adults are listening right now. They're not supposed to be listening. They're supposed to be paying, you know, doing their own thing right now. So they're getting the thrust of what the big sermon is right now. He already told them, even though you've sinned, I'm going to make sure and bring one who would, who would take care of the serpent, this uh, Satan, take care of that. So already there's a hope of salvation. See, it's, we're sinners. And God's not happy with that. But God certainly loves us. And He has provided us Jesus to be our Savior. He's unhappy with our sin, but He loves us. And He wants to take care of us that way, okay? So, I encourage you, as if you can, either a Bible storybook or, you know, um, as you learn to read more and more things... Or use apps or other things to learn about it is to especially study those first few book, or the first few chapters of the Bible, to love to love God more because we realize that even though we are sinners, He loves us greatly, and has promised to give us Jesus as our Savior. Okay, all righty. Well, good, y'all. Think about that, and remember, God loves you and uh, has given us Jesus as our Savior. Okay, all right. Thank you. prayer. Our Father, we are we are grateful for your mercy that has come to us. Um, though we were not there in the garden, we know that we're as guilty. Um, we, we know in our own hearts within the, ourselves that we have a disposition that's turned away from you. And though um, in this room, it's filled with people who have recognized, been moved by the working of your spirit to uh, help us to see our sinfulness and have seen the beauty and the glory of who Jesus is. And we've been prompted and led to embrace him, to turn from our sin and repentance and embrace Jesus in faith as the Redeemer, we still know that that influence of sin is with us. So we pray for your ongoing work of sanctification to, re to empower us to overcome, help us to give ourselves over to the leading and the prompting and the guidance of the Holy Spirit and to less and less render ourselves over to the sinful nature that still influences us even though it's no longer the dominating force of our lives. We want to become better Christians. We want to live holy lives for your name's sake. Help us do so. But we recognize that there's in so many ways we are inadequate and we fail continuously. And so we ask that you will um, do that work just as you've promised in your word. We pray that uh, you will help us as we uh, uh, relate to one another in the church, encouraging and uh, 
supporting and helping one another in this life of faith and worship. So we pray that uh, the blessings of this particular church to us and to others we may share them <clears throat> with will be very evident. Uh, we rejoice in the ones that have been named and recognized recently. We rejoice in those people you've led to us to fill out and, and uh, make our fellowship and the membership within this body more complete. We pray that we will more and more uh, not only use our gifts to support one another, but you will add to our numbers. Um, we know that uh, just from uh, seeing and reading the news as well as our observation of things within our society that sin is certainly still evident in the lives of people. There's so many disruptive and dysfunctional things within the hearts of men and women that is disrupted. Satan is still tempting and uh, alluring people away from truth and from what is right to that which is wrong and displeasing and contrary to your word. And so uh, we know that ultimately you must move. So we call on you and we pray for your reviving uh, uh, ministry, that the spirit would move to bring revival and awakening in the hearts of people, conviction of sin, recognition of the need of a savior. We pray for that. We pray for it right here in this community and this, uh, this region that we all live in, that you would move. We call on you to move across this land. The United States of America is a very affluent and prominent country, and yet there's still lots of sin and iniquity running rampant. We pray for your movement in this land. We pray for you to equip and quicken your church here in America and worldwide to be an effective gospel force, proclaiming the good news of Christ, making known the beauty of your truth, um, declaring, preaching the word. And we pray that you would do as you've promised, that it would not return void. Your word would have its effect in the lives of people. We pray for that not only for us, but our missionaries, those who open up your word, those who enact the word in their ministries, that you would make that effective wherever they are. We, uh, we thank you for the many blessings we have. We marvel at the good news that though we're sinners, we have been loved and we've been redeemed in Christ. You have not abandoned us to our sin, its guilt and its consequence, but yet you have come and redeemed us. You have loved us that much. So help us to recognize that. Help us to um, appropriate that in our own lives. May that kind of love and the salvation that we have by grace prompt us to a life of full devotion to you in all that we do. Make every word and take every thought captive that it would be something that honors you in our lives. We do pray for those in our church who are going through different uh, afflictions and troubles and the loved ones that we pray for. Lord, grant healing, especially those dealing with cancer. Grant to them your peace and your strength. Heal them of this disease that they can be fully strengthened to carry out their work and to serve you well. We pray for those with other struggles as well. We think of Miss Virginia, we miss her so much and pray that you'll bring her back among us soon. Give her strength day by day. Give her clear mind and thought. Help her to function well. But uh, Lord, uh, grant to us health and strength and peace according to your will that we may serve you in this church and in our community. We love you. Thank you for hearing us. And we pray that you will.
nogmaals. We sterven er al We thank you for every good gift. We return this portion asking your blessing upon it to make our ministry effective in this place for your name's sake. We come and make our offering and our prayer in Jesus' name. We taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And um, We've read half of the, uh, Genesis 3, and we'll return here to read the rest of it. And this is where um, we at least get the hints of the good news here. The hints of the good news. Um, because I said it's going to be the year of the gospel, and now I'm reading about Adam and Eve sinning in the garden against God and all the mess that that made. Where's the good news? Well, I'm going to show you. There is good news to be found here. And uh, so, starting with verse 14, Genesis 3, picking up this reading. We started earlier from verse 14. You'll follow along here, and you'll see. Look for the good news in God's reply, his response. Give attention, the word of the Lord. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her, hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim, and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. This ends the reading of God's holy word. So there you have it. Most of that's bad news. Most of that's pretty ugly. And uh, it's, it's not myth. It's not, um, it's not some you know, fairy tale. Uh, we take it to me exactly as it has been presented. It's a historical account of something that happened. We are, we are completely dependent. Even the one who penned it was completely dependent upon God to reveal what happened at the beginning. Now, we very well could have been that through Adam and then the uh, ones who followed, there was certainly a message. Uh, they, could, they could tell what went on. There was a mechanism there. Uh, we, we do believe very strongly that our Christian faith it's not just about truths. 
in the abstract, but they are truths that have been revealed, recognized, and things that have been affected in real time in history. And one of the supporting, uh, the, the supporting aspects of that is that we have historical scriptures that tell us about how God has worked throughout history and time. So we're completely dependent upon God revealing that, doing this, and then it being preserved with, even within the experience of people to tell us this. But it's, that's what happened. It's a place, it's people who were created, who had a marvelous uh, existence of beautiful harmony and fellowship with God in an abundant, uh, glorious existence in this garden. And they were given a command, that one command, the one command that was given, the law of God was known by one command at that point, and that was this one tree, the knowledge of good and evil. They were not to eat of it. And in the first part of the reading, we saw how the tempter comes along, the serpent. Um, it's Satan either through the serpent or I've heard somebody use a uh, pretty, it's fairly persuasive argument that that's more of a title. The serpent was the title given to Satan in the garden rather than the, the form that he took. But nevertheless... Uh, there's too much there, to, you know, it, it's using that imagery of the sly, crafty snake and crawling on his belly and all that sort of thing. Uh, it's been traditionally understood Satan took up the form of a serpent to bring this temptation. And so it, it works. It helps us to account for both the, that it's Satan and that there was a serpent involved and what that means. But nevertheless, he comes along and tempts Eve first, but they both transgress by eating of that fruit. They disobeyed the word of God. They disobeyed what he had said. They violated the law and the command that God had given them. It was very clear. They had an abundant and full garden to eat from. And the one tree was off limits. And through this process, as it said earlier, she saw that the fruit was, of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom. The tempter had convinced her that somehow eating this was going to, it wasn't only about eating a fruit. It wasn't only about the stomach. It was also about some wisdom or some uh, knowledge that would be beyond that. And when she transgressed by eating and giving to her husband, they transgressed. Then that's what we call, theologically, we call it the fall, the fall of mankind. It's not just a fall because it was an accident. It was a fall because it was a deliberate transgression of the word and the law of God by Adam and Eve. And from this point, from that point, it changes the whole condition of creation, of the humans themselves, and all who would come after them. What was as a you could probably pick that up in those few questions we read. You can read a few others in the catechism to see the way it's described there. They were created in this beautiful place of holiness and righteousness, a condition of holiness and righteousness in a perfect and harmonious environment. And from that point, after sinning, not only was the ground cursed, was there things outside of themselves, but something was changed inside of them, inside of them. They were changed. And so from that point, we call it the fall the fall into sin. Not just that they sinned and it brought us a condition or situation or a punishment or a consequence, but that the sin actually had an effect on their very nature. It was corrupted. It was now changed. And so that's the world we live in. That's the experience that we have born, been born into. That's the nature of which we have received. One of the struggles, I kind of alluded to this, we're talking about the adult class today, is I think one of the struggles in trying to live a life of faith and righteousness before God is that we long for what was in Eden. We want it to be that way so much. We know that it's promised to be like that or maybe better than that in the future, but yet we have to live having the blessings, the redemption, the renewal of Christ now, but we have to live with it now in this fallen world in still bearing with a fallen nature. And it makes it tough. It makes it a struggle. Uh, so that's the situation. You know, we, we, uh, the, the previous reading took us up to the temptation and the sin, the transgression of God's command. That, again, I, let me say this again because we 
Um, understand that in, nothing is to be, uh, sin is supposed to be identified in particular as, as it relates to God. To God uh, himself, but also to God and what has been revealed. Okay? That's, that may seem in, uh, either insignificant or what, what are you trying to make of that? Well, it's, it's the notion somehow, I think in our contemporary setting, one of the concerns is, is things are, seem to be deemed acceptable as long as it just doesn't, you know, doesn't have too much of a disruption in our lives or maybe violate somebody else's privileges. In other words, it's right or wrong based on whether it, it works for human beings with one another. And, you know, sometimes we can be very comfortably functional within something that's very sinful with one another. What makes something a sin, whether it's a direct action or a condition, is how it relates to God. And that's very clear right here in this passage. What their sin is because they did what was against God's command. And it changed everything. Okay, so what do we, what do we learn here? We've got, to get to, we've got to get through the bad news and get to the good news. What was the effect? Okay, I've got to keep on with the bad news a little bit longer. What was the effect that it had on them? This is where it's evident, at least in Genesis 3, where it's evident that it's not simply that they committed an act and it was something external and there's guilt and the consequence just related to them or whatever, that it changed their nature. How does it say it in Genesis 3? Well, let's take a look here at um, verse 7. When it says, okay, she saw it was desirable, good for food, pleasing to the eye, desirable for wisdom, she took and ate, gave it to her husband. And then verse 7 says this, when they ate it, here's what happened. The eyes of both of them were opened. Okay, that's the first thing you see. Their eyes were open. Now, what does that, what does that mean? Were, there, were their eyes closed when they ate it? Uh, no, it's not talking figure. Uh, it's a figure of speech. It's knowledge. There was knowledge. There was some awareness that was then made available to them that was not there before. And it's probably very much related. Here's one thing about it. Satan, often his temptations are not that he's completely uh, off base, but rather he perverts what is very much true. When he said... You know, God knows you're going to know good and evil from this. He wasn't lying about that. That's exactly what was made available to them. They now were brought, their eyes were, their knowledge was available, not knowing about it, but knowing it for real in their, in their very essence. They now were in a condition, in a position, in a place to be now in, in the place of knowing it in terms of participating in it, in being in the realm of doing that which is good or evil and now having it all part of their experience. Their eyes were open. They now had this awareness of who they were that was very different. And that awareness included the fact that they had just disobeyed their creator and the one who had provided and put that there. And that was open to them. So their eyes were open. Then what else it says? And this is, this is part of their eyes being open, their awareness is they realized they were naked. So prior to that, the shame of nakedness was not part of their original condition. They were, the, the harmony, the, the, um, the closeness of fellowship with one another and with God and with nature was so uh, perfect, it was so harmonious that there was no, there was no shame, there was no fear of, of uh, danger or shame that had to be hidden. It's, that was the moment where shame of uh, self was introduced because now there's an awareness of self as an as a evildoer, as a transgressor. And, uh, and knowing that. So all of this stuff, they're, they're changed internally. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to show you how Genesis 3 is making clear to us. This wasn't just a single act of transgression that could be dealt with. This is something that actually changed them. Their nature. As the catechism question said earlier, that sin, it, it had various consequences, but it corrupted their nature. And those are the ways it describes it as being completely changed. And so... What they do about it? Well, they went and tried to make their own leaf coverings. Uh, that's not the only thing. What else? When God finally comes to them and says, uh, what are you hiding for? And Adam says, well, I heard you and I was just shamed because I'm naked. He said, who told you you were naked? Again, that's just having this awareness. The shame now has entered into this relationship. Because of transgression, because of sin, because of violating the Word of God. And then what does he say? This is beautiful. This is, I mean, I don't want to mean beautiful. It's not good. I'm just saying it's a beautiful depiction of exactly how we tend to deal with our own guilt 
even now. Who told you? Uh, did you eat from that tree? Oh, yeah, yeah. The woman you put here with me, she gave it to me to eat. He was guilty, but what's he doing? He's deflecting it over here. So God turns his attention to Eve. What is this you've done? Oh, the serpent deceived me. You see how the, see how the nature, the, the, the whole way of relating is different and changed? Instead of personally, at this personal intimacy and closeness and openness with God, now there's something that separates and something that's sort of like, I can't, you know, I'm not going to deal directly with God. I'm, uh, if I'm wrong, I'm not dealing directly. I'm, you know what, I'm going to cast it off on somebody else. And so you see that that nature of each is, is very different. The man and the woman both demonstrate their eyes being open, their shame, and their readiness to cast the blame somewhere else is demonstrating this corrupted and cha corrupted nature, this very changed nature. That's the effect. That's the effect of it. Um, now, what are the consequences of it? So the, there's the change that happens internally. The consequences are the things that were imposed on them. And of course, there's a couple of things. Uh, but... Uh, first, you get this listing. God goes through each one of the participants and announces a curse, we often call it. You know, a curse doesn't have to be like hocus pocus by wizards or, you know, magicians as we are depicted in a lot of our literature or movies or whatever. The curse here is just simply saying it's imposing a consequence upon them that they now must deal with and live with. That's what this curse is. What is it to the serpent? The serpent, I would say, is one of, of humiliation and a guarantee of defeat. What does it say? Cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You'll crawl on your belly and you'll eat dust all the days of your life. Now, again, this is where you have to be careful. If you're only thinking about serpents or snakes, okay, then that's, you know, you, you realize lots of us are... I always admire those people who don't mind, you know, like, hey, there's a snake under the porch, and they just crawl under there, and they just grab the thing and walk out with it and take care of business. I, I love that, but I can't do that. I, I, I don't know, you know, I've not had experience, I don't have the guts to do that sort of thing. Uh, I like that. For most of us, though, yes, that enmity between humans and snakes of various sorts sort of is around, so that's, that's very real, that's there. But remember, ultimately, this is not speaking to snakes. This is something God is handing down and declaring to Satan, who is either known by the title of serpent or, as is traditionally understood, he used the mechanism of a snake to make this, to bring this temptation. And he says, he says, you will crawl on your belly. And this is a way of saying this. It's just... I'm imposing things on you to humiliate, to put you down into this humiliated state. You will know this. The eating of dust is an expression of humiliation, um, of, of being, uh, of being, you know, humble to a lowly place to be under authority and and and, and face things that way. And of course, there's ultimate defeat. And I'm going to return to this because it says, you know, you're going to have this enmity between the descendants or the seed of the woman, and you'll you'll strike. Uh, I know some of you probably have translations that use the same word. You'll, he'll bruise your head, you'll bruise his heel. Uh, the NIV, as I read it, specifies because it's, it's trying to uh, bring out the reality. A wound to the head of a serpent is one that is crushing, that it, it is deadly. It's a fatal type of wound. Whereas the strike on a heel is it's not pleasant, but it is simply... A strike on the hill, it's a bruised hill, it's not really that big a deal. And so that's the point. Satan, you you be sure of this, or as a politician would say, mark my words. <laughs> you will go down and defeat. Humiliation and defeat is pronounced right here by the living God. Um to the woman, and I'm gonna come back to that in just a second. The woman. Uh, pain and childbirth, the desire for your husband and the rule of the husband. That's the imposed thing. It, it's almost like when you read that, well, first of all, you know, the pain of childbirth. It, it appears that whatever would have, whatever, if they had been obedient, if they'd remembered. Now, we, we hypothetically sometimes talk about that. Well, what would have happened if they hadn't sinned? 
Well, the thing is, is that it's, it's all hypothetical. We'd be speculating. How would it have come about? Would they have immediately got to eat the tree of life and had an abundant eternal life and that would have ushered in whatever happened after that, even reproduction and all that would come? Would, would, you know, it's still hypothetical because that isn't what happened and so we're stuck kind of you know, wondering. But it's almost as if, if, if they had not fallen into the state of sin and misery, Childbirth would not have been painful. There probably would have been natural ways in which that would have been prevented. There would have been a natural epidural that would have kept everything comfortable. Uh, just the other day, um, she's back there, so you know, uh, the conversation come up about pain in childbirth, and I think Abby said something like, "You know, guys are just so lucky; they don't have to worry about that." And I'm just, I don't know about this. I don't know about having children because of the pain that it'll cause. So, well, remember. You are very blessed to live in an era where there are great uh, tools at medical science disposal to make sure you stay comfortable. So you can at least give thanks for that. So, oh, yeah, I guess that's right. So, um, Well, but uh, the curse is that it would be a painful. A major role for women would be to bear and to birth children. And he's saying, now that you've fallen, the consequence of that, part of the curse of this experience is that it's going to be hard. It's going to be painful. But there's also the desire, uh, is it desire in a loving way? No, the desire here is the desire over the husband who has been put in the place of authority. In other words, there's going to be resentment of that authority in that place. There's going to be enmity and struggle in this relationship, okay? Amen. We, we know. If, you, if you've entered into marriage, you know. I'm of the belief now, as the more I'm learning and more... You know what? Every marriage at various points is going to come to a tipping point. I mean, there's going to be a place that, that, that it's, it is hard enough, this struggle that it, that's part of this curse. And what's happening is that we're finding out that more times than not, it's, it's bringing them to an end rather than through God's grace or whatever other means possible in a human way to overcome those challenges. All of them are faced. Why is that? Well, it's part of this curse. It's part of this struggle of, of you know, relationship. That's, it's all of it. And I'm not, I'm not saying that it's always the woman's fault. It's not that at all. It's just this enters into a, a tension in this relationship. So that's the woman. Now what about the man? What about Adam? Because you listened to her, your wife, and ate from the tree, here's what's going to happen. You had an abundant garden at your disposal, but you know what? That's no longer there for you. Now you're going to go out there and you're going to till the ground. You're going to sow your seed. You're going to have to work it. You're going to have to make sure all the work is done to cultivate what you eat. That's the consequence. By the sweat of your brow, you're going to have to do this. And of course, as it ends, it says they were moved out of the garden and it was protected. They weren't allowed to go back, not just for the tree of life, but any of the trees. They weren't allowed to eat from any of them. That's the consequence. Now, in the midst of all this cursing, these horrible consequences handed down by God, not only was there a change internally of the man and the woman, but there's, he's handing down a consequence. Um, you know, in Romans 8, there's a section that says, all creation is groaning and awaiting the revealing of the sons of God. In some ways, it's like, it's not just us. It's not just the creatures who are made in God's image who need salvation or longing for uh, Christ to come and to get us and to, and to bring us into the fullness of the kingdom and the new heavens and the new earth. Everything is groaning. You know, the destructive floods, the tsunamis, the hurricanes, the earthquakes, everything. And the more we hear of that, I think it's one of the reasons why those are the signs listed. It's just telling us the world as it is is in a fallen and a cursed condition. And it's letting us know it ain't happy. Even the creation, even the inanimate creation is longing to be renewed when God does his final work to make the new heavens and the new earth. So all this bad stuff, okay? This, Jeff, I thought this was supposed to be the year of the good news, the gospel. Here it was. Theologians have termed that expression when it was given to the serpent as the proto-evangelium. Proto-evangel. What does that mean? It's the first announcement of the good news. How did it say it? Listen to this. Speaking to the serpent... Satan, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and 
the woman and between your offspring or seed and the woman's. And then it changes pronouns. He, masculine, singular, he, will crush your head and you will strike his masculine singular pronoun his heel yeah I know it's sort of sort of blended in there it's kind of hidden it's not explicit we don't know all the fullness of that but not only was he de declaring the defeat but there's also here a hint of who what's going to happen it's one of the women, it's one of the descendants, it's a seed, it's a singular he who would be the one who would ultimately strike the fatal blow to the serpent. It's the first announcement of the good news of the gospel that would be brought to us in Jesus Christ. It also sheds a little light on that phrase. I, I made a, a reference to this verse uh, in Christmas, just talking about the, the incarnation. Galatians 4.4 4 says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent His Son. And then there's this born of a woman. And you know, if you read that, and you're like, well, how else would He have been born if He was going to be a human being? Born of a woman. It's sort of like a little way that Paul, moved by the Spirit, put in there to say, look, the one born of the woman, the seed of the woman, the seed of the woman Eve has now in the fullness of God's purposes and plan and time has come. The one who was said to be born of a woman, a seed of the woman to crush Satan's head, he now came in the flesh to do it. Of course, Paul already knew he had done it and was proclaiming that. But when he made reference to his birth, his being born of a woman, it's suggesting Jesus Christ is the one that had first been promised right here. So when was the gospel first preached? It was preached in the garden after the sin, before they were kicked out. The gospel, the good news of God's grace that saves us from our sin in Jesus Christ fills the whole scriptures. It was first announced right there. Now look, notice the nature of God. Nature of God is no sound. I've got to wrap this up. I need to tell you. Even at the worst point of Adam and Eve's experience, the moment they fell, the moment they realized their shame and their guilt, and God comes to them. He questions them, sort of like a prosecutor. He, he, gets, them to, he gets them to just confess their own guilt. He doesn't, he knows, but he gets them to confess their own guilt and what they've done. And when they do that, at the worst moment, even after handing down the penalties and the consequences, what does he do? He goes and makes skins for them to be covered. You get to see both sides of the nature of God, okay? I mean, our contemporary society, contemporary world of life has wanted to make God all benevolent, benevolent and all good without, with disregarding any chance that God could, could do anything, you know, of a judging or condemning nature. No, you get to see God is righteous and just, and He handed down the just consequences of the sin. But you know, He's not only that either. The other side is He's merciful. They had just disobeyed him directly, given up all, the, all of the abundance that he had provided in order to pursue another way. He gave them the consequence, but then in mercy he provides the skins. But he's also assured them of ultimate victory.